so delighted to welcome back to this very high school President Barack Obama. Wisconsin. So it is good to be back in the Midwest. It is good to be close to home. Now I have to say in advance, first of all, somebody just pointed out I, I, I spilled some salad dressing on my shirt. Which Michelle will tease me about tonight. But what can I do? Uh, you know, th th this happens sometimes. Uh, I love you too. Give it up for your next governor, Tony Evers. Your next members of Congress, Randy Bryce and Dan Cole. A leader we are sending back to the Senate, Tammy Baldwin. It is good to be back. There are a lot of good reasons to come to Milwaukee. You got the Brewers, great season. Did much better than my Sox. You got the Bucks, 4-0. Uh, Giannis is balling. You got the Badgers. You've got brats. You got beer. Uh, so, so there are a lot of good reasons why I would want to come to Milwaukee. Couple, couple of my nephews, Austin and Aaron, also live here. They're little guys, but they're getting bigger all the time, which is why I try to beat them at basketball now before they can beat me. <laughs> but, but all those reasons aside, that's not why I'm here. I am here for one simple reason. I am here to ask you to vote. To vote in what might be the most important election of our lifetimes. Now, politicians will always tell you, that, oh no, this one's really, except this one, it really is that important. The stakes really are that high. The consequences of anybody sitting out of this election are profound. Because America's at a crossroads right now. The health care of millions is on the ballot. Making sure working families get a fair shake is on the ballot. Whether the union movement survives or not is on the ballot. But maybe most of all, the character of our country is on the ballot. Now, the good news is that in the past, when we've been at these crossroads as a country, uh, Americans have made the right choice. But we don't always do it right away. Sometimes it takes too long to make the right choice. And when we do make the right choice, it's usually not because people sit back and let history happen to us. It's because folks like you, folks like me, marched and mobilized and voted for a better history, voted for a better future. That's how we abolished slavery. That's how we overcame 
the Great Depression. That's how we liberated a continent. That's how workers' rights came about and women's rights came about and civil rights and immigrants' rights and LGBT rights. That is how the story of America became a story of progress because we got out there and did the work. Because, you know what, the truth is making this country better has never been easy. It's always been a fight. For every two steps of progressive change forward, a lot of times we take one step back in conservative retrenchment. That's what happens. That's been the pattern. Every time we pull ourselves closer to our founding our ideals, that all of us are created equal and endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, whenever we start moving in that direction, the status quo pushes back. You win the right to form a union, then people try to bust your union. You fight and win a higher minimum wage, and then Congress just doesn't raise it for a decade. You win the right to vote, people try to make it hard for you to vote. The powerful and the privileged fight hard to keep what they got. And they will try to make you angry and cynical and distracted. And they'll try to exploit our history of racial division or ethnic division or religious division. They'll try to pit us against one another. They'll tell you that, oh, no, everything would be OK if it just weren't for those folks who don't look like you. They'll say whatever it takes to keep their stuff, to maintain their privileges, even if it's not fair, especially when it's not fair. They like it that way, even when it hurts the country, even when it puts people at risk. It's a cynical kind of politics, but frankly, sometimes it works. Now, the good news, Wisconsin, is right now you can reject that kind of politics. You can choose a bigger, more hopeful, more generous vision of America. But to do it, you got to vote. Right here in Wisconsin, you can early vote right now. Just go to vote.org. Find out where you can cast your, your vote today. And then go cast it for Tammy, and Tony, and Randy, and Dan and the entire Democratic ticket. And don't let anybody tell you it doesn't matter. I, you know, I, I, I get frustrated when I hear that. Think, think, think back to where we were a decade ago. We had been going through one of those conservative periods, and Republicans had been cutting taxes for the rich, They've been cutting rules for big banks. And we got hit by the worst financial crisis in our lifetimes. And Democrats had to come in and clean it up. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how it is that we've got such a short memory. They did exactly what they're doing now, and then it blew up, and then we had to go clean it up. And we got the economy growing again. It's been growing ever since, by the way. So when folks talk right now about, oh, the economy's doing so well, where do you think that started? Come on. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. We didn't, we didn't just get the economy going again. We covered 20 million people with health insurance. We doubled the amount of clean energy we generate and created jobs in the process. We put tougher rules on banks and credit card companies. 
we cut our deficit by more than half. And part of the way we did it was making sure that the wealthiest Americans paid their fair share of taxes. So by the time I left office, wages were rising, the uninsured rate was falling, the deficit was down, the economy created more jobs, by the way, during my last 20 months in office than we have in the 20 months since I left office. I, go look it up. I, I, go look it up. That's what happened when we had a progressive agenda. Now, we didn't get everything done that we wanted to do. We couldn't reverse all the trends that had been happening for 40 years in just eight years. We couldn't get all the manufacturing jobs that had left to come back right away. We couldn't immediately eliminate all the inequalities that had been building up over decades. And we sure couldn't do it once the Republicans took over Congress because they blocked everything we tried to do. All right, so they've now had two years of control in Washington. What have they done with that power? No, it's not true they haven't done nothing. It's not true they haven't done anything. Let me tell you what they've done. They cut taxes for the rich and corporations to the tune of $1.5 trillion, just like they did the last time. They stripped rules to protect our air and our water, just like they did the last time. They ran up the deficits, just like they did the last time. And you know what? They know that none of this stuff is actually popular. So their response, instead of changing their policies, is to try to actively purge voter rolls to keep people from voting. And they try to scare everybody else with whatever divisive social issues they can come up with, just like they did the last time. So, so, so let's just take a look for a second about what, what they've been up to. They promised to take on corruption. Remember that? They have gone to Washington and just plundered away. In Washington, they have racked up enough indictments to field a football team. Nobody in my administration got indicted. So, so, so how is it that they clean things up? In Wisconsin, some of your governor's own cabinet secretaries said that after all the schemes and cover-ups, they're endorsing Tony Evers for governor because they saw what happened and they didn't like it. Let me tell you something. As somebody who had worked for me, said right before an election, he's terrible. I'm supporting the other guy. I, I would feel bad about myself. But they don't, because there's no shame. Their promise to drain the swamp, that was not on the up and up. So let's see, what else did they say? They said they'd fight for the little guy. Instead, they have catered to the most wealthy, the most powerful. Like I said, $1.5 trillion in tax cuts aimed at billionaires and corporations did not even pretend to pay for them. Deficits shot up. When it came to helping the most fortunate, the people with the most, they did not care at all about deficits. But when it came to helping everybody else, suddenly deficits are terrible. When, when we were trying to provide health insurance to folks who really needed health insurance, oh, you can't do that. Deficits. Wanted to expand early childhood education. No, 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 no. We can't afford that. Deficits. It's an existential crisis. It's terrible. Deficits. Oh, you want to give a tax cut to me? 
and I don't need it, wasn't asking for it, that we can do. That's fine. And then just last week, now that they got the, de uh, the, the tax cuts out, now that the wealthiest are wealthier, now that the country's more unequal and fewer people are being helped by the kinds of programs that would give kids a chance and give working families a leg up, now suddenly Mitch McConnell, but no, don't boo, don't boo, vote. Don't boo, vote. I'm making a point here. Just last week, suddenly he said, you know, I'm very disturbed about these deficits. We're going to have to bring them down. We're going to have to cut programs like Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. No, no. Look it up. Here, here's the thing. Everything I say, you can look up. He said it. He's quoted. Say it. So, so just think about that for a second. Cutting Medicare and Social Security, right? Making it tough for working people to retire. For, for your grandma or your grandpa to make sure they got enough to eat and the roof over their heads. You're going to cut that so that some billionaire's tax bill is lower. That doesn't sound like fighting for the little guy to me. Sounds like a scam to me. All right, and then let's talk about health care for a second. Eight years ago, Democrats passed the Affordable Care Act. Right here in Wisconsin, 20, uh, 200,000 people suddenly got coverage. 200,000 people got help. The law made it illegal for the first time for insurers to discriminate against you if you've got a pre-existing condition. And by the way, I'm looking out at the crowd. Some of you are young. Maybe you don't think you've got a pre-existing condition. I promise you, by the time you get to 57, you got something. It might be you, you battled cancer. It might be you, you've got an asthma scare. But according to insurance companies, even be, just being a woman is a pre-existing condition. And they were charging women more for insurance just for being a woman, which is a lot of golf. Because if there weren't women, then those insurers wouldn't be there because I mean, you, you can't charge women more for insurance because they get pregnant, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. So that doesn't make much sense. That's, 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 that's not a logical approach. So we, we put an end to that. Democrats made that happen. Not a single Republican, not one, joined us. Not one. Repeat that, not one. Since that time, they have spent the last eight years obsessed with trying to undermine, sabotage, repeal that law that makes sure you're not discriminated against because of pre-existing conditions. They, they've done everything they could. They took over 60 votes in Congress to get rid of it. And if Republicans keep control of Congress, you better believe they're coming after it again. And Wisconsin, you can't afford to let Tammy's opponent become the deciding vote that guts your protections against the insurance companies. But that's not the worst of it. That's, that's not the worst of it. Now that it's election season, these same Republicans are running millions of dollars worth of ads around the country saying we're going to protect pre-existing conditions. Your governor's been running one of those ads while his administration is literally suing the government 
to take away pre-existing conditions protections. So you know who you can trust when it comes to protecting, pre uh, uh, protecting your health care? And, and, and making sure you're not discriminated against because of pre-existing conditions? You can count on Tammy Baldwin to do it. She was diagnosed, as you heard, with a pre-existing condition when she was a kid. She knows what it's like for parents and grandparents to worry about covering a sick kid. She's not going to let Republicans gut those protections. She's not going to let Republicans gut your Medicare to pay for their tax cuts. These Democrats are going to protect your kid. If you elect Tony Evers as your next governor, he's going to do something your current governor refuses to do. He's going to expand Medicaid to cover 176,000 more Wisconsinites. That's going to make a difference. But you've got to vote for him, and you've got to vote for a Democratic legislature to help him do it. So don't, don't think that this election doesn't make a difference. Your vote doesn't make a difference. But, but, but I want to go back to what I was saying earlier about those ads those Republicans were running, because I want you to think about this for a second. We, we just kind of take this for granted. Your governor has been running an ad during election time saying he is going to protect pre-existing conditions when he is literally doing the opposite. That is some kind of goal. That is, that is some kind of chutzpah. But let's also call it what it is. It is a lie. And, 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 and that brings us to a bigger question about this election. Who are we? What kind of politics do we want to see? What kind of accountability do we expect from our elected officials? You know, it's one thing to have a legitimate policy difference, but if you take one position, then you should be held accountable for the position you take. You can't suddenly pretend you didn't take the position because it is politically expedient. You can't just lie about it. Look, let, let's, listen. Throughout human history, <laughs> certainly throughout American history, Politicians have exaggerated. They make promises that they may try to fulfill, but then it turns out to be harder than they expected. They pump up the things that they did that were good. They downplay the things that didn't work out so good. They try to put a positive spin on things. And by the way, before you get too down on politicians, we all do that now. Uh, you know. When I'm talking to Michelle, sometimes I'm all like, oh, honey, man, do you see I did all the dishes? You know, and she's all like, eh, yeah, but that's like the first time you've done that in a week. What's, what'd you do wrong? And I said, well, we all do that to some degree, right? I mean, it's human nature. But what we have not seen before, in our recent public life at least, is politicians just blatantly, repeatedly, baldly, shamelessly lying, making stuff up, calling up, down, calling black, white. That's what your governor's doing with these ads, just making stuff up. Just, it's, it's, what he's saying is not true. And by the way, that's what Republicans in Congress are doing all across the country. On, on this pre-existing condition thing, they're running ads everywhere saying, we're the ones protecting it. It's not true. <laughs> the president said he'd pass a middle-class tax cut before the next election. Congress isn't even in session. He just makes it up. He says, I'm going to protect your pre-existing conditions while his Justice Department is in court right now trying to strike down those protections. That is not spin. That's not exaggeration. That's not trying to put a 
a, a positive glow on things, that's lying. And look, it, it'd be one thing if, if it was the first time, but, but they, they've done this often. They just, and, and, and accompanying making stuff up, they then try to scare the heck, scare, scare the heck out of people before every election. It's always something a little bit different. And then suddenly the election comes and the problem that they were scaring you about is suddenly magically gone. You never hear it about it again. All right, so, so let me just kind of run through this just to jog your memory. In the 2010 midterms, it was government bureaucrats are going to kill your grandma. Remember the death panels? Just made it up. But that was a thing. 2014, Ebola is going to kill all of us. Remember that? In the last election, it was Hillary's emails. This is terrible. Hillary's emails. We were hearing emails everywhere. That it's, uh, this is a national security crisis. They didn't care about emails. And you know how you know? Because if they did, they'd be up in arms right now as the Chinese are listening to the president's iPhone that he leaves in his golf cart. It turns out it wasn't, that, I guess it wasn't that important. They scared you about the deficits. Now, now the latest thing, they're, they're, they're convinced, they're trying to convince everybody to be afraid of a bunch of impoverished, malnourished refugees a thousand miles away. That, that's, the, that's the thing that, that is the most important thing in this election, not health care, not, not uh, you know, whether or not folks are, are able to retire, not, not you know, doing something about higher wages or rebuilding our roads and bridges and putting people back to work. Suddenly, it's this group of folks, we don't even know where they are, they're way down there. That's the biggest thing. And you know, as soon as the election's over, everybody will be like, what, 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 what happened? We were being invaded. Where, where'd it go? <laughs> and it, you know what? It would be funny, except they do it every time, and too often it works. And everybody gets all freaked out. And we got to stop falling for this stuff. We, we're like Charlie Brown with the football. You can't fall for that okie doke. Don't be hoodwinked. Don't be bamboozled. Wisconsin, don't fall for that kind of fear mongering. Because while they are distracting you with all this stuff, they're robbing you blind. They're giving tax cuts out to billionaires. They don't want you to notice that. Look, look, look over there. They're sabotaging your health care. Wait, look, look. They're letting big polluters rewrite our, our laws to, to, that keep our air and water clean. I, ignore that. Look, look over there. It's like a con where you know, a door-to-door -door salesman tries to sell you a security system while his buddy sneaks in the back takes all your stuff. It's like Home Alone. You remember that movie? <laughs> Joe Pesci's sidekick, he's trying to sneak in the doggy door. I guess you're too young for that. <laughs> but, but, but you know what? The, 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 there's a more important point here. When words stop meaning anything, when people can just make up anything, Democracy doesn't work. Society can't work. If, 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 we, if, if, if you can just say anything, and there are no consequences if it turns out what you're saying is not true, well, how, how are we going to have any kind of accountability? And frankly, part of the problem is, is that we've gotten used to it. We just expect that like people just are going to just make stuff up. We just expect it. And part of the problem 
frankly, is, is that a big portion of the media right now are used to it. And, and a part of them just repeat the lies over and over again. I, I mean, I promise you, Fox News will not tell you that what the Republicans are saying about pre-existing conditions aren't true. But you know what? It'd be nice if the serious outlets did and weren't distracted by the same kinds of fear-mongering that was done every election cycle. But I guess they can't help themselves, so they just cover it. So until we, we start getting a little bit better about calling a lie a lie, the only check we've got on this behavior is you and your vote. And I know, I know during elections, it's natural for us to talk about Democrat and Republican. You know, that, that's part of how the democratic process works. And obviously, I, I really think you should vote for Democrats, because our policies will actually make a positive difference in people's lives. And we actually do fight for the little guy. Rather than let Republicans keep attacking unions, Democrats will stand up for every worker's right to organize for higher wages and stronger benefits. And rather than let Republicans side with big banks while they're gutting the public university system, Democrats will invest in our public schools and help more Wisconsin students earn a higher degree without going broke. But there's something at stake in this election that goes beyond party. What is at stake is a politics that is decent and honest and lawful and tries to do right by people and that's worthy of this country we love. Because it shouldn't be Democratic or Republican to say we don't just make stuff up. It shouldn't be Democratic or Republican to say you don't punish political opponents or threaten the freedom of the press just because you don't like what they say or write about you. It shouldn't be Democratic or Republican to say we don't target certain people based on how they look or how they pray. It shouldn't be. I love you too, but I'm making a point right now. You know what? I've got to believe that there are compassionate conservatives out there who think that there's nothing compassionate about ripping immigrant children from their mothers at the borders and leaving them in a cold cell. And I know there have to be people who consider themselves fiscally conservative who don't think there's anything fiscally responsible about trillion dollar deficits. I, I've got to believe that there are people of all political stripes who think it's wrong when you say deficits don't matter when you're helping rich people and pretend that somehow they matter a lot when you're trying to help working people. There have got to be people, I don't care what your party is, who think it's wrong to spend eight years trying to take away people's health care and then spend the final weeks before an election pretending you're Florence Nightingale. There have got to be people who say that's not how politics should operate. I've got to believe that, that there are certain things that transcend party and that whatever your political background, I'm hoping you think it's wrong to hear people spend years, months, vilifying people, questioning their patriotism, calling them enemies of the people, and then suddenly you're concerned about civility. Please. And by the way, we don't need more mealy-mouthed elected officials who claim they're disappointed by this bad behavior, but then don't do anything about it and just go along with it. We need leaders who will actually stand up for what's right, regardless of party. Leaders who will fight for you and what's best in the American spirit. Patriots who will stand up for anyone whose fundamental rights are at stake, whether it's your health care or your kids getting bullied in school because their last name is different. 
or a neighbor who's being harassed because of who they love. Wisconsin, that's what all of us need to stand up for. With clarity and patriotism and purpose. The values that bind us to our fellow citizens. The values your mom taught you and your dad taught you. That somehow we just ignore. What's happened? We, 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 we got to get back to that just basic stuff. We can have disagreements, but there has to be a certain code. There has to be certain rules in terms of how we treat each other and operate in the public sphere. And that's what Americans do. That's what Americans do. That's who we are. That's, that's what America is at its best. And that's what these candidates believe. That's what Tammy believes. That's what Tony believes. That's what Randy and Dan believe. And that's why I'm hopeful, Wisconsin. I am hopeful, despite all the noise and the lies and the distractions, that we're going to cut through all that and remember who we are, who we're called to be. I am hopeful that out of this political darkness, a great awakening of citizenship is happening all across the country. I can't tell you how encouraged I've been watching so many people get involved for the first time, or for the first time in a very long time, marching and organizing, registering people to vote, folks running for office themselves, record numbers of women vote, uh, who are running, young veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, Am Americans who, who might not have been interested in politics before, but suddenly laced up their shoes, or if, if you're Randy, you know, they, they kept their work boots on. <laughs> but he traded in his tool belt for a clipboard be, because they believe this time is different. This, this moment's too important to sit up. The antidote to government by a powerful few is government by the organized, energized many. That's what this moment's about. And, 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 and I want to tell you, one election won't fix everything. That's the truth. If, if you vote in this election, it's not as if suddenly poverty is eliminated or you know, all, all the jobs that left are coming back or you know, suddenly there's no discrimination. Women are always treated with respect. That, you know, that's not how politics work. It's, it's not like everything gets fixed all at once. But I tell you what, if you vote, things will get better. If you vote in this election, Wisconsin, it'll be a start. You've got to get started and then just keep on going because the threat to our democracy doesn't just come from one person in the White House or Republicans in Congress or lobbyists in Washington, or the Koch brothers. The biggest threat to our democracy is our own indifference. The biggest threat to our democracy is us getting so cynical that we just stay home. We don't participate. Because that's how, in 2011, Republicans made Wisconsin one of the worst gerrymandered states in the country. In 2012, Democrats won a majority of votes in the State Assembly, and somehow Republicans got two-thirds of the seats. It got rigged. The fix is in. I mean, think about that. Who's ever heard of that? You know that's not fair, but that's, just, that's how the system operates. In this current election, all across the country, Democrats are going to have to win a lot more votes just to stay even, and even more votes after that to take over the Congress because of this gerrymandering tomfoolery. 
And that's why you've got to vote for Democrats up and down the ticket to break their grip, make our congressional districts fair. When you vote, not just for Tammy and Tony, when you vote for sheriff and district attorneys and state reps and secretaries of state and state treasurers, you've got the power to make sure our voting rights are protected. Our criminal justice system treats everybody equally under the law. When you vote, you have the power to make sure we strengthen laws that protect women in the workplace from harassment and discrimination and abuse, and to make sure that women are paid the same as men for doing the same job. When you vote, you have the power to make it a little bit easier for a student to afford college, and maybe a little bit harder for a crazy person to shoot up a classroom. When you vote, you have the power to make sure a family keeps its health insurance. You could save somebody's life. That power is in your hands if you vote. And if you get involved and you knock on some doors, you talk to your friends and convince some new neighbors and talk to that family member that is a little confused, and you get them to vote early for this entire incredible Wisconsin team, you know what's going to happen? Something powerful happens. Change begins to happen. Hope begins to happen. And with each new step we take in the direction of fairness and justice and equality and opportunity, with each new step, hope spreads a little bit more. It starts with you. Let's get to work. Let's go vote. God bless you, Milwaukee. God bless you, Wisconsin. God bless America. Thank you.